Um, my name is uh, James Buchanan. I'm one of the, the conveners of the special interest group and I'll, I'll moderate the session today. Um, before we, we kick off, um, a few kind of housekeeping bits and pieces um, to, to go through. Um, we're going to have two presentations today, um, one from uh, Michael and one from Kakit. I'll introduce them both in, in a second. Um, this is part of a webinar series that we hope will be quite frequent over the course of, of 2023 and beyond. Um, so if you have uh, material that you, you want to present to this sort of audience, then do get in touch. Um, it's quite likely we'll be able to find you a slot uh, later on in the year, and it can be quite a good form for getting um, for publicising your work, uh, spreading the word and for getting hopefully constructive feedback on the work as well. Um, so yeah, do let us know. Um, uh, contact us via um, any of our emails, uh, myself, Elias or Didi, who are the three founding conveners or, or get in touch via our Twitter account as well. Um, second thing on the housekeeping list is um, I think uh, quite a few of you are already probably members of the special interest group, but um, if you're not, I'd encourage you to join us as a member, uh, which is fairly straightforward to do on the I Hear website, and uh, then you'll get the emails that we send out to let you know of SIG activities and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the, the final housekeeping thing is to mention that um, uh, many of you will be aware that I Hear released the um, the abstract decisions last week for the, the Congress that's going to take place in Cape Town this year. Um, we are planning a SIG meeting um, as part of that Congress. We don't know exactly when yet. It will probably be on the Monday or the Tuesday in the early evening, uh, sort of five till six-ish, that sort of time. Um, but we haven't got a confirmed slot yet. Um, so if you're going to be at Cape Town um, and um, you are uh, free during that time, then you're welcome to join us and uh, we will get together as a special interest group and um, uh, you meet and, and discuss how the group will move forward and different activities that are going to take place, etc. Um, so do come and join us then. Okay, uh, that's all on the housekeeping list. So um, let's, let's get started. Um, so as I said, we have two presentations today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Kakit. I'll introduce Michael a little later on. Uh, so Kaki is at uh, King's College London uh, as a health economist, obviously, um, and uh, he's uh, working on economic evaluations uh, and various other types of analyses um, related to screening and chronic conditions and uh, currently uh, working on projects related to genetic testing, um, amongst other things. Um, I think I'll let you introduce your topic, Kaki, if you want to, to load your slides up. Um, you are not quite full screen yet. That's perfect. Okay, so uh, 20 minutes, um, each person will present for 20 minutes and then we'll have some time, uh, maybe 10 minutes or so for questions um, afterwards. So uh, without further ado, Kaki, it's over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and thanks, James, for the introduction. And thanks, I hear and the SIG for the platform to share what I'm doing. Uh, so my name is Kaki, I'm a research fellow from uh, the Department of Population Health Sciences at King's. And uh, the topic I'd like to share with you today is the genetic guided pharmacotherapy for cardiovascular diseases. It's a systematic review of economy evaluations. So uh, just a heads up, this is not a complete work. So uh, some, of the, some of the analysis are preliminary. So uh, bear that in mind and uh, look forward to hearing some feedback from some of you uh, at the end of the session. So a uh, brief outline, a story, a brief background, some methods on how we conducted the systematic review of economy evaluation, snapshots of big picture findings, and uh, some thoughts on what I plan to do next with the findings. And we'll have the Q&A after, after Michael's presentation. So in background, uh, we know that uh, globally, there's high burden of cardiovascular diseases, including the UK. In England, one in four deaths are due to CBD, but uh, the but the large issue is also that CBD is largely preventable through, uh, through medications and also lifestyle modifications. Uh, so the question that we like to that cross our mind is, is there a way to treat cardiovascular diseases more efficiently? The answer is that it's possible by targeting patients with treatment based on their risk. And risk can be identified based on genetic factors, lifestyle factors, and their current health status. All of all these factors, genetic factors are arguably one of the easier to target because genetic factors do not change over time. You just need to test once 
identify the genetic risk and the risk, uh, and, and the risk will, and that's the risk conferred by the genes, unlike uh, lifestyle factors that changes over time, depending on how the individuals behave. So the objective uh, of, so we conducted an economic value, systematic of accommodation to, 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 to find out the state, the extent of the evidence for pharmacotherapy uh, that is designed, uh, customized based on uh, genetic risk factors, genetic factors. We would like to find out, we want to know what are the findings of this eco economic evaluation. We would like to know how, uh, that we know to their study designs and uh, study characteristics. And for those economy evaluations that are based on models, how the models accounted for the effect of uh, the pharmaco uh, pharmaco uh, pharmacogenetic testing as well as uh, what are the variables that are influential in changing the base case uh, conclusions on cost effectiveness. So on methods, uh, it's a systematic or economy evaluation. The searches uh, were done, I think in 2019, we updated twice, 2020 and also 2022. And these are the da databases that we searched, uh, which included uh, four websites, websites of four HDA agencies. Uh, three HDA agencies. And we did title abstract screening by two, in, two separate individuals, full text screening by separate two separate individuals. And, was, and we also did uh, citation searches backward, meaning we checked the reference list of included articles. We also did forward citation searches, meaning we look at articles, we look for articles that cited the uh, included articles. The articles we were looking for were uh, for patients at risk or diagnosed with cardiovascular diseases. The interventions we're interested in are genetic guided pharmacotherapy, that is testing the genetic genes, genes of the patients. And based on the genes, the genetic testing findings, uh, patients are prescribed uh, different pharmacotherapy based on the test findings. And the comparison can be any, can be another genetic test, genetic test, or pharmacotherapy without genetic testing or non-pharmaceutical intervention. In, uh, we have no restriction on country or the provider setting. Uh, we would like to look for full economic evaluation. That is, they reported, the study must have reported both outcomes and costs. And the economic evaluation can be any type, cost utility, cost effectiveness, cost benefit, or cost minimization. We excluded uh, conference abstracts or reviews, uh, narrative reviews, uh, studies that are not economic evaluation, not CBD, and not genetic guided pharmacotherapy. And this uh, protocol is registered on Prospero, the links below. We did double data extraction for the economic region findings. Uh, the findings, i.e. the incremental cost, incremental effectiveness, and the ISA. And the uh, for the other data, we did uh, single extraction. That is, uh, these are study characteristics, type of the analysis, type of the testing, and type of the pharmacotherapy. And these are what I'll present in this presentation. We also uh, rated the method uh, methodological quality using chart extended, but uh, I haven't had time to look through that for this particular presentation. So we shared, we shared that with you in the paper later when I write it up. Uh, so to address the objectives, this we analyze, uh, we look for the genes, uh, the purpose of testing, uh, why, why are these tests conducted, uh, which genes uh, are tested, Look at the study designs, is whether these are trial based or model based, what type of model, and how was it built, the findings, uh, the incremental costs and effects, what are the effects, and what affects the findings, uh, types of tests, patient characteristics, study design, other variables. Uh, the last one, what affects the findings, uh, I haven't had time to analyze for this particular presentation, so I'll share with you the, the, three, the three analysis uh, in the next few slides. So on findings, uh, this is the study selection full chart from about 6,000 articles. We, after title abstract screening and full text screening, we, have, we found 85 articles from the database searches. And then from the backward and forward citation searches, we found seven more. So total we have 92 articles. And of these 92 articles, 35 are on coronary artery disease, 18 are on atrial fibrillation, 18 on familial hypercholesterolemia, 10 on venous thromboembolism, 
three are not specific. They mentioned cardiovascular disease, but did not specify what are the which type. And then two articles each for heart failure, hypertension, and long QT syndrome. It's a uh, one type of heart rhythm disease disorder. And then one article each for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a uh, thickened heart muscle that makes the heart difficult to beat. And one article for mechanical heart replacement. Of the 92 articles, a quarter were published uh, between 2002 to 2011 across nine years. The second quarter was published within four years, 2012 to 2015. And the next three years, another quarter came out, 2016 to 2018. And then the next three years, the remaining last quarter, 2019 to 2022. Half of the papers have one to five authors, another half, six to 18 authors. About half of the paper originated from North America, a few from South America, about a third from Europe, nine out of 92 from Asia, about 10%, and six out of 92 from Australia or New Zealand. In terms of study designs, minority of these came from trials, uh, not two out of 92, and three out of 92 came from uh, observational studies, uh, alongside observational studies. The rest were model-based. 22 out of 90, 23 out of 92 were solely decision trees. And then 61 out of 92 were Markov cohort or Markov individual models. And three out of 92 were discrete event simulations. In terms of the outcomes they use, majority of the studies use uh, qualities. Some studies also use uh, outcomes, adverse events prevented, myocardial infarctions, deaths, 25 out of 92. Some of them also use life reported life years gain and a minority reported process of care, for example, additional case identified or success of therapy based on their own definition. Most of the articles adopted healthcare perspective, 67 out of 92, a small proportion societal, similar proportion not specified, and one out of 92 adopted a third party payer perspective. A quarter of these articles were examined, examined up to five year time horizon, Six out of six to 25 years, about 14 articles, 26 to lifetime horizon, more than half of the articles, and two did not specify the time horizon. These uh, 92 articles look at various types of, uh, of uh, testing, which can be grouped into these categories. Uh, 40 of them look at genetic testing, for example, testing the CYP2C19 gene to select, this is to select the best drug or treatment for the patients based on their genetic uh, status. Uh, 20 of these articles tested the genes to identify the best dose. So essentially, whether whatever the test result, they'll be given the same drug, but at different doses. And 16 of these are on testing for family hypercholesterolemia. These are used, these, in this case, I classify them as detecting uh, early detection for screening. And then in 12 of them, these testing are used to predict the likely cost of the disease progression for CVD. And then a small proportion of others uh, to determine duration of the medication or to increase patient adherence. Now on the other side, the comparators, most of these articles reported no, uh, use no testing. Uh, as the comparator, and in majority of these cases, these no testing are usual can, 55 out of 78, and in small number of cases, the no testing is not a usual can, 24 out of 78, and in some a small minority, unclear whether this no testing is usual care or not. And then in small number, 14 out of 92, the, the comparator is some, some other testing. Now these, all these comparisons between uh, testing on versus uh, a comparator give uh, 362 comparisons that reported uh, qualities. Uh, and out of these uh, 362 comparisons, most of them are on the upper right quadrant, higher cost and higher qualities, 207 comparisons. 
And the second largest is lower cost and lower quality, 72 out of 362 comparisons. And then 60 of, 60 of these comparisons have lower cost but higher quality, meaning that the, the testing is dominant, 60 out of 362. And in 22 cases, uh, the testing is dominated by uh, comparator. Nice. So you, are, you are familiar with the with with uh, with the willingness to pay threshold. So uh, this uh, to determine whether it's cost effective or not, this willingness to pay threshold is based on uh, the thresholds adopted by the individual studies rather than uh, our own uh, a standard threshold. So different studies in different settings may adopt different thresholds based on their their, their setting that examine. So uh, out of these. So if you put a threshold here, then out of the 270, 207 comparisons that are higher cost and higher qualities, majority of them, 162, were cost effective, 40 of them not cost effective. And in the bottom left quadrant, 70 uh, lower cost, uh, lower qualities, about half of about half of them are cost effective, half of them are not cost effective. Next question we wanted to answer was uh, how did the among so the majority of these studies are model based economy evaluation. How did this model based economy evaluation accounted for the effect of genetic testing? Uh, as you can see in this uh, table, majority of them use relative risk. These are relative risk of CVD events, adverse drug reactions, non specific deaths, CVD deaths, or and or non CVD deaths. So you can, they can Exam, uh, they can use relative risk for one or a multiple combinations of these 41 out of 92 papers. And then some, most of these, many of these papers also use probabilities to reflect uh, the efficacy of testing. Uh, the same events, CVD events, adverse drug reactions, specific tests, CVD, non CVD, or non specific tests. 15 of these, 15 of the model-based economy evaluations uh, use the number of days within a sub range of uh, some biomarkers to, to account for the effect of genetic testing. So those, those who are prescribed the correct medication based on their genetic, uh, in these studies, patients who are prescribed the correct medication, correct medication based on uh, the genetic, genetic uh, status will have will spend longer days within the therapeutic range of the biomarker INR. Uh, Thirteen of these studies uh, accounted uh, accounted for the effect of genetic testing using accuracy, specificity, specificity, and sensitivity. Some of these use uh, a small number use uh, adherence to medication or pharmacokinetics, how our body absorbs or metabolizes the drugs, as to account for the effect of uh, genetic testing. And one study used uh, other methods like number of relatives in cascade testing. Three of them did not report, could not identify how the studies uh, accounted for the field chain testing. And then well, five of them not applicable because these are economy relation along trials or observation studies. Of all these model based finding studies, uh, they, they, in total, they reported 4,000 close to 5,000 variables. Out of these, 2,000 were tested in one-way sensitivity analysis. And out of these, 783 reported ISAs, uh, the incremental cost, uh, incremental effectiveness, and uh, the ISAs. And out of these, uh, 784, 883, 154 variables changed conclusions in the one-way sensitivity analysis. In most of these cases, uh, these were epidemiology variables, for example, the prevalence of the of the gene gene status or gene mutations, the probability of events, for example, uh, deaths. And then next, and then uh, the next more frequent variables that change conclusion were relative effectiveness, thirty five out of one hundred fifty four. The next one is the cost, like the cost of testing or cost of the medications, 29 out of 154. And then utility and others, for example, discount rates. So uh, these are all the findings I have got so far. So what's next? Uh, what I have in mind now is to 
next to look at whether the findings differ, differ based on the study designs, how the models, for example, how the models accounted for, whether the methods, how the models accounted for the effect of genetic testing affect the findings of the economic evaluation, and whether the findings also differ based on the types of cardiovascular disease. I would like to, I would also like to go into more details on how the, the variables that change the conclusion uh, on cost effectiveness. So uh, in analyzing this account for methodological quality rating. And, uh, and I'll, that's the end. I'd like to thank to uh, I'd like to thank the NIHR NIHR BRC uh, for funding my time and the project and the student who helped to improve the data extraction form, uh, two temporary research assistants who helped with data extraction, and my co-authors, Rosita from Oxford, Julia, Charles, and Phil. Our clinicians for their feedback and ideas. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, any thoughts, questions, or collaborations, feel free to email me. And that's my Google Scholar profile. Uh, and we'll have questions after Michael's presentation. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Kakit. Um, that was very interesting. Um, what we might do actually is um, we'll, we'll do questions while this is, this is fresh in people's minds. Oh, okay. um, so thank you for keeping to time. Um, we've got um, at least five minutes for questions now, um, and then we'll do Michael's presentation and then we'll, if there's any time left at the end, we can pick up any other questions. So, um, as I said in the chat, if you want to ask your question in person, uh, just put your hand up, um, otherwise put it in the chat and, uh, and I can ask it for you. We are recording, uh, so if you ask in person, you will appear on the recording. <clears throat> While people are thinking of their questions, maybe I can I can kick us off. Um, one of the things that was, was most interesting, I thought, towards the end was when you mentioned that only, I think it was 29 out of 204 instances of, of, of the cost or the price being a, a driver of the economic evaluation results, which, which I thought was a little surprising. Um, could you unpick a little bit more uh, what might have been driving that? Is it because these are relatively cheap tests in the grand scheme of things, or is it simply because the other parameters dominate? Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Uh, I, I, at the moment, I can't give a, a definite answer because I haven't looked through them carefully uh, or thoroughly enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we actually done the analysis for uh, for for so I haven't done the analysis for the overall, uh, all the papers, but I've done. We have done analysis for some of the, some of the some of the subset of the uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, for 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 okay. I think the short answer is I don't know. But my guess is, my guess is, uh, my my guess is that it depends on the on on the types of uh, testing and the the type of diseases, uh, because for what we observe in the coronary artery disease is that the cost for the testing has not changed much within the years where the the economy vision has been done, but for venous thromboembolism, the cost started very high and then dropped. I think more than tenfold within the within within. By, by the time the last study was conducted. So I think it depends on, so to unpick that, I think we have to go through very detail on how how exact how exactly the cost change and whether the findings diff were different when the cost was higher versus when the cost was lower. I hope that makes sense. No, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it would be useful to unpick that um, because I, I assumed that you were, when you talked about the cost or unit price, you were talking about the testing rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. treatment treatment that follows yeah, yeah. and it'll be interesting to know you know what what proportion of uh, you know the, the overall effect is due to the the test cost versus the cost of the the treatment that follows in the in the economic evaluation equation um there's a there's a question from sally in the chat um i'll, I'll read out um will you also look to do subgroup analyses based on factors within conditions uh, so here thinking about things like disease severity or penetrance um, extent of redundancy in the catalytic pathway, or, or it might be that there's just not enough studies to go into that level of detail. Although I think with 92 studies, uh, hopefully you, you, you can go into some detail, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, sorry, it's your... That was Sally. Sally? Oh, Sally. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, we, yeah, I'll, I would like to look at that. But uh, from, from, my, from, my, from my understanding of the data now, very little studies describe the disease severity. Well, so when they, so for example, when they look when they look at coronary, coronary artery disease, they they just use coronary artery disease. They do, they do not describe the severity of the patients uh, that they included. So so I don't think we can. I mean, maybe you can do that for a small number of papers, but uh, but not not all of them. Uh, in terms of penetrance of genetic variants, uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, I think not not all studies reported that but given that there are clusters of genes like for example uh uh within studies reporting uh, looking at uh coronary artery disease the genes that they tested are more or less the same few so to to so to look into how the how the genetic variation uh, the penetrance of the genetic variation may may have to do a bit of uh of uh, yeah, data extraction for the, or maybe it's in the list of variables that they, mm -hmm. they 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 use in the model. Yeah, so we have to have to look carefully at that. I hope that address your question. Sally. Thanks, thanks, Kakit. Um, uh, Mandy, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks very much for that very clear presentation. Very interesting. I just have a couple questions which may be related um so so you may have covered this um but there was a lot of information there so did you find cost benefit analysis studies because it seems the majority of cea cua which doesn't really surprise me but i wondered if you had found any um and if you could summarize unless there's a lot then and also from this systematic review have you got any ideas about the future research that you want to do yeah thanks Mandy for the question uh yeah I think I did not have it here but yeah none, none of the studies not none of the economic vision was, was called cost benefit analysis okay. so that's question your first question and then uh what the based on these uh maybe based on what I've known so far I think if I were to do a study I'll, I'll be interested to uh to know to do to do uh a study to uh uh to look at how to look at the effect of uh accounting the different methods of accounting for effects of genetic testing and how that affects the finding i think that would be an interesting methodological research mm -hmm. if so if you can look at ways that are mutually exhaustive mutually exclusive uh, that can be that, and with data available that can account for different ways to account for the effect in the model and we can see whether uh combinations of them or or one one way or the other gives different findings of favorable or less favorable findings than the others uh, yeah thank you and good luck <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay thank thanks mandy um, I might uh, pause there um, and uh, any more questions, we hopefully will have a couple of minutes left at the end. Uh, Kaki, will we see a, a finalised version of that presentation in Cape Town or? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I was hoping that I likely won't, but uh, I hope to I hope to submit this to HCSG uh, if it goes well, yeah. That would be good. That would be good. OK, um, we may come back again at the end if we have time. But for the time being, uh, thank you, Kakit. And we'll we'll go to Michael if you're around, Michael. Hopefully you are. Uh, yeah, I'll just start sharing my screen now. OK, so uh, Michael is a PhD student uh, in Aberdeen, uh, working with uh, Mandy, amongst others, who you just saw, um, and uh, working generally on on topics related to the, uh, the translation of genome sequencing into clinical practice in the context of, of rare diseases. Um, and I will stop there and let you say a bit more if you want about your, your background in this study. So 20 minutes, Michael, and then we'll go to questions. Great. Okay. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Abbott, and I'm a researcher and a PhD student at the Health Economics Research Unit at the University of Aberdeen. 
Uh, and today I'll be giving an overview of the results of a cost effectiveness analysis of genome wide sequencing for the diagnosis of rare developmental disorders uh, in Scotland. So just to give some background on the project, um, approximately two to 5% of children are born with rare developmental disorders um, and dying these, uh, diagnosing these conditions um, often involves a long, costly and stressful series of testing, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here have probably heard this referred to as the diagnostic odyssey before. Um, the diagnostic odyssey typically involves a series of gene panel testing um, and normally several gene panels are required to reach a diagnosis. Uh, it can take many years um, and in many cases patients either never receive a diagnosis or are misdiagnosed along the way. Um, however, new genomic technologies including whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing have the potential to reduce the length of the diagnostic odyssey by increasing the proportion of patients who receive a diagnosis. Um, but despite the, the growing clinical evidence on the increased effectiveness of these tests, uh, the health economic evidence to support their transition into clinical practice is still quite limited. Uh, so this is really where our project comes in. Um, our project is a collaboration between health economists and the Department of Medical Genetics at the University of Aberdeen and using data from two research studies. So firstly, the Scottish Genomes Partnership or SGP, um, their involvement in the UK 100,000 uh, Genomes Project. And secondly, the Deciphering Developmental Disorders or DDD study. Um, we received funding to conduct an, a, a cost effectiveness analysis of testing strategies for the diagnosis of rare developmental disorders in Scotland. Uh, so getting straight into the, the model, this slide provides an overview of the basic structure of our cost effectiveness model. Um, we used a decision tree model to compare the cost and diagnostic yield of six alternative genetic and genomic testing strategies. So firstly, we evaluated standard genetic testing um, involving first line chromosomal microarray and fragile X testing, uh, followed by gene panel testing. And that's the sort of iterative series of testing, which is often referred to as the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, next, we evaluated two trio whole exome sequencing strategies, where trio refers to the, the proband plus two biological parents. Um, first, we evaluated exome sequencing as a last resort test, so after all other testing has failed to reach diagnosis, uh, and then as a second line test uh, where exome sequencing replaces gene panel testing. Um, and then finally, we looked at three alternative trio whole genome sequencing strategies uh, where genome sequencing was a last resort test, uh, a second line test replacing gene panels, and a first line test replacing um, all other testing. And um, for each of these strategies, we estimated the cost effectiveness in terms of incremental cost per additional diagnosis compared to the ne next best alternative testing strategy. Um, so the first part of our economic evaluation involved estimating the cost of um, each alternative genetic and genomic test. Uh, and this table summarizes the costing inputs that we used in our model. So firstly, we costed the standard genetic testing pathway, um, so the, the diagnostic odyssey. So by attaching unit costs to SGP and DDD research study participants' uh, testing histories, we estimated that first line uh, chromosomal microarray and fragile X testing costs 400 pounds per proband uh, and second line gene panel testing uh, and clinic visits then cost a further 2,392 uh, pounds for those who didn't receive a diagnosis from, from first line array testing. Um, we then estimated the cost of trio genome sequencing uh, using micro costing. Uh, so for genome sequencing, we costed two alternative options. So firstly, if genome sequencing is delivered using a similar pipeline to the SGP research study, we estimated that it costs £5,576 per trio. Uh, and secondly, we costed an alternative pipeline uh, where the sequencing is outsourced to a third, third party sequencing provider. Um, and that resulted in a lower cost of £3,781 per trio. Uh, so we used the um, higher cost, the SGP study cost, in our base case analysis and um, explored the, the lower uh, alternative pipeline in our sensitivity analysis. Um, 
Finally, we estimated the cost of trio whole exome sequencing, um, which is currently offered for severe developmental delay within NHS Scotland. Um, and again, using microcosting, we estimated that that costs £1,153 uh, per trio. Um, so moving on to the effectiveness side of the cost effectiveness analysis, uh, we expressed our clinical outcomes in terms of diagnostic yield. So uh, the proportion of people who receive a correct genetic diagnosis. Uh, and this table shows the diagnostic yield data we used for each test, uh, as well as the 95% confidence mm -hmm. intervals. Um, so using systematic review data, um, we used a diagnostic yield of 10% for first line um, chromosomal microarray and fragile X testing. Um, and then second line gene panel testing gave a, a further 21% diagnostic yield. Um, the only tests which we actually had direct um, primary diagnostic yield data on uh, were last resort genome sequencing and last resort exome sequencing. Uh, so here we used the SGP and, re and DDD research study reports um, where patients in those studies received either genome sequencing or exome sequencing as last resort tests after, after all standard testing. Uh, so there we used the diagnostic yield of 23% for last resort genomes, uh, genome sequencing and 21% for last resort exome sequencing. Um, and then as genome sequencing and exome sequencing are used earlier in the pathway, their diagnostic yield increases. Uh, and uh, using published systematic review data, um, again, for, for earlier genome sequencing, exome sequencing, uh, we estimated that the diagnostic yield increases to up to 46% for um, first line genome sequencing. Uh, so then putting these uh, costs and diagnostic yield together, uh, looking at the results for the base case where whole genome sequencing costs £5,576 per trio. Um, this table shows the results of the, the base case cost effectiveness analysis. Um, this is a deterministic analysis, so all the costs and diagnostic yield inputs are, are fixed at their, their mean values. Um, but what this table really shows is that compared to standard genetic testing, uh, second line whole exome sequencing, so replacing gene panel testing with exome sequencing was a cost saving option for the Scottish NHS. Um, so second line exome sequencing cost an expected £1,402 with an expected diagnostic yield of 42.1% uh, and that saved £1,076 and increased diagnostic yield by 13.9% uh, compared to standard genetic testing. Um, so then compared to second line exome sequencing, which is the, the next best alternative, uh, last resort exome sequencing, so exome sequencing after all other testing, uh, increased cost by £1,839 and increased yield by 2.7%. So that gave an incremental cost for additional diagnosis of, of just over £68,000 uh, for last resort exome sequencing, suggesting that it's, it's better to do exome sequencing earlier in the pathway rather than saving it for, for a last resort test. Um, then in terms of the genome sequencing strategies, we found that second line genome sequencing had a higher cost and uh, marginally lower diagnostic yield than last resort exome sequencing and was therefore uh, dominated by last resort exome sequencing. Um, first line genome sequencing um, increased cost by £2,335 uh, with an incremental yield of 1.2%. Uh, so the incremental cost per additional diagnosis there was, was really high, at just over £194,000 per additional diagnosis. Um, and finally, last resort genome sequencing, so uh, genome sequencing after all standard testing, um, only increased diagnostic yield by 0.1% for an additional £592 uh, so the ICER there was uh, £592,000 per additional diagnosis. Um, so then visualizing these results in sort of not in a table form, uh, we use these uh, deterministic cost effectiveness results to construct an efficiency frontier. Um, so in the efficiency frontier, the uh, orange line here connects the strategies which could be cost effective depending on how much we're willing to pay per additional diagnosis. Uh, so as seen in the previous table, second line exome sequencing, uh, so replacing gene panel testing with exome sequencing, uh, dominates standard genetic testing uh, with a lower cost and a higher diagnostic yield, uh, suggesting that standard genetic testing would never be a cost effective strategy, regardless of how much we're willing to pay per additional diagnosis.
Um, and then compared to second line exome sequencing, uh, last resort exome sequencing involves doing more standard testing before the exome, so uh, the cost necessarily increases, um, but it also increases the diagnostic yield by around 3%. So last resort exome sequencing is more costly, but also more effective than second line, second line exome sequencing. So uh, the cost effectiveness of, of last resort exome sequencing depends how much we're willing to pay um, to reach a diagnosis. Uh, next, compared to last resort exome sequencing, uh, you can see just from the steepness of this orange line, really, that the, the incremental costs are really high compared to last resort exome sequencing, um, and the incremental yield is very low. So uh, it suggests that our willingness to pay per additional diagnosis needs to be very high to justify the additional cost of first line and last resort genome sequencing compared to last resort or second line exome sequencing. Um, but as I said, going through the costs, uh, that was the base case analysis where we used a cost of £5,576 per trio. Uh, we did also um, run a one-way deterministic sensitivity analysis using a lower trio whole genome sequencing cost of £3,781 per trio. Uh, this is where the sequencing was outsourced to a third-party provider. Um, so since the cost of trio exome sequencing and standard testing are, are the same in this sensitivity analysis, uh, second line exome sequencing is still a cost saving option compared to standard genetic testing. Uh, but now compared to second line exome sequencing, um, first line genome sequencing um, increased costs by £2,379 for an additional 3.9% yield. So the diagnostic, uh, the incremental cost per additional diagnosis for first line genome sequencing has fallen from 194,000 pounds in in the base case analysis to 61,000 um, pounds in in the um, sensitivity analysis. Um, looking at last resort genome sequencing, the there's an incremental cost of 1,200 pounds compared to the first line genome sequencing, uh, and again an incremental yield of only 0.1%. So the incremental cost per additional diagnosis there is 1.2 million pounds. Um, so what this sensitivity analysis told us is, firstly, um, the lower cost of whole genome sequencing has a, a huge impact on the incremental cost per additional diagnosis. It fell all the way to 61,000 from 194,000. But also, as the genome sequencing cost decreases, it becomes better to do whole genome sequencing earlier in the pathway. Um, and that's indicated by the fact that the incremental cost per additional diagnosis uh, for last resort genome sequencing increased to £1.2 million when the lower genome sequencing costs were used. So the, the key message there is really that as the genome sequencing costs decrease, if you're going to do genome sequencing, it's always better to do it earlier in the diagnostic pathway. Um, so in addition to that sensitivity analysis, we also conducted a threshold analysis, um, and this tells us how much each cost or diagnostic yield input would need to increase or decrease by before the optimal strategy changes. Um, so a threshold analysis requires us to um, know how much the decision maker is willing to pay per additional diagnosis. And although there isn't a standardized cost effectiveness threshold per additional diagnosis, uh, we used a value of £8,800 here. And this wasn't a com completely random value. It was um, based on the cost and diagnostic yield of standard genetic testing. Um, and to us, this was an indication of what the Scottish government has historically been willing to pay for a diagnosis. Uh, so we use this as a sort of proxy for the cost effectiveness threshold. Um, but using this uh, threshold of £8,800 per additional diagnosis and uh, everything else equal, we found that significant reductions in the cost of genome sequencing or improvements in the diagnostic yield of genome sequencing are still required before the optimal testing strategy changes. So, for example, the cost of genome sequencing per trio needs to fall to £1,742 uh, from £3,700 to £5,500 uh, before first-line genome sequencing becomes cost-effective. Uh, and on the diagnostic yield side, uh, the yield of first-line genome sequencing needs to increase from 46 to 89% before it becomes cost-effective at that willingness to pay threshold. Um, so still um, significant reductions in costs or improvements in yield required before um, these become cost-effective compared to second-line exome sequencing. 
But again, that's assuming this willingness to pay threshold of 8,800, which isn't necessarily clear. Um, and it's assuming everything else uh, equal as well. Um, so the final bit of analysis that we did was um, so far, everything has assumed that um, all inputs are fixed at their mean, mean value. And in reality, there was significant uncertainty in our costs and in our diagnostic yield inputs. So to explore the uncertainty in our model, in our model results, um, we also conducted a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Um, so rather than fixing everything at its mean value, we assigned a probability distribution to each cost and each diagnostic yield input. Uh, so costs were given a, a gamma distribution and diagnostic yield uh, beta distribution. And uh, we use that to generate this graph, which is a cost effectiveness acceptability curve for each genetic and genomic testing strategy. So on the x-axis, we have the willingness to pay per additional diagnosis, uh, ranging from zero to 100,000 pounds. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of each strategy being cost effective. So this tells us for any amount that we're willing to pay per additional diagnosis, what is the probability that each strategy is cost effective? Um, so as we saw in the main results, second line exome sequencing was a dominant strategy with a lower cost and higher yield than standard care. Um, and as a result, it was most likely to be cost effective at all willingness to pay values up to £83,000 per additional diagnosis. So as long as the decision maker is willing to pay at least, uh, sorry, up to £83,000 per additional diagnosis, second line exome sequencing is most likely to be cost effective. Um, but as willingness to pay per additional diagnosis increases, um, the probability of alternative strategies being cost effective also increases. So beyond £83,000 per additional diagnosis, uh, first line genome sequencing becomes most likely to be cost effective, which shows that um, as our willingness to pay increases, the optimal strategy can change. So we do still need to know how much the decision maker is willing to pay per additional diagnosis. Um, so in terms of discussion points, um, one of the key questions from our analysis is how much is the decision maker actually willing to pay uh, for a diagnosis? And I think within health economic evaluation, we're probably used to hearing of, uh, the um, nice guidelines of 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality, uh, but no such guidelines exist for the economic evaluation of genomic diagnostic tests, where outcomes are rarely exp expressed in qualities are, are often expressed in terms of diagnostic yield. Um, so without a standardized cost effectiveness threshold for diagnostic testing, um, it's still quite challenging to make policy recommendations about um, the cost effectiveness of genome sequencing. But one thing that we can take from this analysis is that the probabilistic analysis indicated that unless we're willing to pay more than £83,000 per additional diagnosis, uh, second line exome sequencing is most likely to be cost effective. Um, and as an additional discussion point, um, the this economic evaluation, uh, a cost effectiveness analysis focused on diagnostic yield as the primary outcome measure. Um, and in a literature review that we did, as well as some interviews with uh, SGP research study participants, we found that although diagnostic yield was important, uh, patients and families with uh, rare developmental disorders also valued other clinical factors like changing medical, medical management of the condition, um, access to uh, new clinical services. They valued informational aspects like uh, information to inform reproductive choice and uh, the feeling of contributing to genetic research. Uh, they valued process factors associated with how genetic testing is delivered, so things like uh, waiting times for test results. Uh, and finally, psychological factors like peace of mind, closure, and, and relief um, associated with the test. So although chance of diagnosis and diagnostic yield is clearly fundamental uh, to patients, focusing on diagnostic yield on its own might not account for the broader value of genome, genome sequencing to uh, patients and families. So to try and capture the value of those broader factors, we're currently piloting a, a stated preference survey, um, including a discrete choice experiment to estimate the broader value of whole genome sequencing um, to patients and families. And then we're going to use that data from the survey in a user perspective cost benefit analysis model 
to account for um, the, the value of factors beyond just the chance of diagnosis. Um, so just to summarise, um, given recent developments in genome sequencing, the Scottish NHS needs to develop a, a genetic and genomic testing strategy for the diagnosis of developmental delay. Um, so we compared six alternative genetic and genomic testing strategies in a cost-effectiveness analysis model, uh, and we found that offering trio whole exome sequencing as a second-line test, so replacing gene panel testing, um, increased diagnostic yield by 13.9%, and decreased cost by £1,076, um, suggesting that second-line exome sequencing is a cost-saving option for the Scottish NHS. Um, we also found that strategies involving whole genome sequencing um, offered small increases in diagnostic yield uh, compared to exome sequencing, but increased costs significantly. Um, so we found that willingness to pay per additional diagnosis would need to be very high um, at around £83,000. To, adjust, to justify the additional cost of genome uh, sequencing compared to exome sequencing. Um, but that, that being said, going forward, we uh, do aim to take a more holistic view of the value of genome sequencing to patients and families uh, beyond just diagnostic yield um, with a user perspective cost-benefit analysis model. Um, so estimating the value of these tests uh, beyond just uh, cost per diagnosis. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for listening to my presentation today and uh, yeah happy to take any questions or comments now thanks excellent thank you very much michael um it was uh, really great to see those results particularly as i've seen sort of earlier iterations of things you've done in your phd so it's great to see that you've uh, you've got reached this point uh, and also having seen many sort of pretty poor economic evaluations in this space it was great to see a nice textbook presentation of <laughs> of the uh, the results um but without further ado because we've only got five minutes for questions um i can see um wendy has her hand up um and i'm going to be really disappointed if wendy doesn't ask a question about costing right and i know when you were referring to pretty poor economic evaluations you weren't referring to our work so Absolutely that's... <laughs> not, Wendy. Absolutely not. so um great to see that work michael congratulations it actually validates our we had the same finding in ontario canada where we landed on second home uh, second tier whole exome sequencing as our funded strategy. Um, not surprising that uh, whole genome sequencing only being slightly marginally more effective in terms of diagnostic yield, that it's really not cost effective unless there's a significant drop in cost. So that, um, I just wanted to wonder if you could elaborate more on this outsourcing um, lab strategy as opposed to the research base. Why was the cost of whole genome sequencing so different? Um, and is that outsourcing a reasonable policy option for Scotland? Um, yeah, so we sort of wrestled with the cost of genome sequencing for a while, but um, basically the first genome sequencing costing option, so the, the higher costing option that was about 5,500 pounds per trio uh, was based on sort of very early experience of genome sequencing within a research study. So it involved consenting participants, uh, recruitment costs, infrastructure costs, study setup, all, all those things. Um, so we tried to update that pipeline as far as possible to reflect what genome sequencing would look like in clinical practice rather than in a research study. So I think, if anything, that base case analysis with the £5,500 per trio is probably far too high compared to what you could get a genome for now. Mm -hmm. So that lower option, uh, which um, I, I actually can say this now because we've got permission to, to report these costs, but it, it involves outsourcing the cost to Genomics England rather than doing it within um, NHS Scotland. Um, so it is definitely a realistic option um, to have it at that, that 3,700 pounds instead of 5,500. I think if anything, the 5,500 is probably too high these days. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, there's a, a couple of questions from Sally, and I might pick up the first one in particular because it relates to a question I was going to ask as well. So Sally asks, um, is um, whole genome sequencing ever performed when whole exome sequencing doesn't result in a diagnosis? And in, in a similar vein, I wanted to pick up on the fact that you presented uh, these strategies at the start that you were going to compare, but how did you get to that subset of, of strategies? Because everything leads on from that, basically, in terms of the economic evaluation results, and that's kind of crucial to, to everything that follows. 
Yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll start with the is whole genome sequencing ever performed when exome doesn't result in a diagnosis? And I think the answer to that is currently no, because what's maybe not clear from the presentation today, but might be clearer in the, the full paper version is um that the diagnostic yield that we've used for genome sequencing here is essentially genome sequencing with panel-based analysis where they do sequence a whole genome, but they only really look at the um, the exome uh, at the moment for the majority of cases. Um, and they are starting to find more diagnoses beyond just the protein coding, coding region of, um, of the genome. Um, but we're not quite sure how much that costs to do um, yet at the moment. So we haven't looked at any options where genome sequencing is performed after exome sequencing doesn't result in a diagnosis because so far that hasn't been happening yet. Um, so yeah, we're within NHS Scotland, at least we're not really aware of many people getting a genome following a negative exome. So um, not currently a realistic option within NHS Scotland. Um, in terms of the strategies and how we came up with them, um, it, as I said it in the in the presentation, it's a collaboration between health economists and geneticists at the, the University of Aberdeen. So uh, we relied very much on our uh, geneticists to validate the model strategies uh, from a clinical perspective. And we came up with these strategies, which uh, we thought are a, a realistic set of alternatives that could be delivered within Scottish clinical practice. Um, so I think it was trying to inform as far as possible future service delivery within NHS Scotland and which options could NHS Scotland realistically look at. Um, so um, yeah, that, that's mostly how we came up with the strategies. I have seen that um, we, we didn't evaluate a first line whole exome sequencing um, strategy, for example. That was because at the time of, sort of model conception and development, um, it wasn't considered a realistic strategy. We were um, thinking that um, first line array test would always occur prior to an exome, uh, but there is potential that a first line exome could be a, a realistic alternative now as well. Um, so yeah, strategies were sort of genetics, um, clinical genetics opinion and trying to uh, inform what could be delivered in Scottish clinical practice. Okay, thanks Michael. Um, the second part of Sally's question, or the second question that Sally asks is, you know, and I know the title of uh, the topic of Sally's PhD, so it's a very leading question from Sally's perspective. Um, how did you decide on diagnostic yield as the outcome measure, and do you think the results would change if you were um, using qualis as the outcome measure? Um, well, we decided on diagnostic yield as um, almost sort of as the, the narrowest form of economic evaluation that you could do in this area because it's uh, just the most obvious clinical outcome measure. Uh, and also at the time of starting this project, there were not that many economic evaluations in this area. Um, there are significantly more coming out now. Uh, a majority still using cost-effectiveness analysis with diagnostic yields, but yeah, increasingly some starting to use qualies and also estimating net monetary benefit using cost benefit analysis as well. So um, I do think the results would change if you used qualies uh, instead of diagnostic yield. Uh, but to use qualies as the uh, outcome measure, we probably just need more data on longer term outcomes, longer term changes to clinical management, um, which we can't currently do without trying to extrapolate from our existing data over a longer term time horizon, which would just result in so much uncertainty that I don't think the results would be very meaningful at this stage. So um, yeah, I think results would probably be different with qualies and would probably also be different with cost benefit analysis, looking at some of the uh, broader value of, of the test. Um, but I think that, that sort of leads on to what we're doing next in this project as well, which is uh, user-based cost benefit analysis. So. Yeah, sure. You can give us the answer to that question in, uh, in about a year's time, I guess. Yeah. Um, do we have um, any more um, questions from the audience? If not, I, I will use Chair's privileges to maybe ask one final question to kind of wrap things up a little bit, which is, um, this is a collaborative piece of work uh, to inform decision making in Scotland. How have the results been received so far by by Scottish decision makers? Um, I guess I guess the Scottish government. And as a kind of follow up to that, given that you've sh shown that um, outsourcing testing uh, to England 
is uh, a strategy that might uh, improve estimates of cost effectiveness. Uh, how has that been received as well as a, as a possible way forward? Yeah, I think um, sort of mixed, mixed reception depending on who you're talking to. Um, so a lot of people, this is sort of in line with what they're seeing in clinical practice and in line with, with what they would expect to see that an exome is, a second line exome is a very efficient way to look at a lot of genes for developmental delay compared to gene panel testing. Um, and a lot of people just not surprised that that results in cost savings. Uh, we also did a budget impact analysis alongside this, which I didn't go through today and found just um, significant cost savings associated with second line exome compared to standard testing. So that was broadly in line with what people expected to see from the exome. Um, I think the more controversial part is the genome sequencing results, where um, a lot of people who are maybe more invested in a genome um, are surprised to see the incremental cost of a genome and the very small incremental yield of a genome um, compared to an exome at the moment. And I think the they are sort of correct that these gen genome sequencing costs are likely to fall uh, in the near future and diagnostic yield is likely to improve in the near future. But I think our threshold analysis and our probabilistic sensitivity analysis shows how much these costs still need to fall and how much this yield still needs to improve before it becomes a cost effective option. So, um, yeah, I think it depends who you talk to um, on how well the, the work is received, but um, hopefully within our threshold analysis, we've showed that there's still some way to go in terms of getting a genome sequence um, into clinical practice for rare developmental disorders in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. I mean, of course, that doesn't mean that it won't enter clinical practice for reasons aside from cost effectiveness, but uh, no, interesting to see that, that that's where things are at the moment. Okay, I, I'm, I'm aware of the time uh, and we've gone a little bit over, so I'm going to wrap things up now. Um, I don't think we really have any time for any additional questions, but um, I'm sure Michael and Kaki will be very happy to, to get some feedback um, if you were to drop them an email. So please do that if you want to carry on the conversation. Uh, this has been recorded. Um, so uh, within the next few days, I, I think the recording will be on the I Hear website uh, for you all to, to view again. So, so do uh, take a look at that if you're interested. Uh, and uh, as I said at the start, um, we will be running more webinars like this throughout the year. So um, if you're not already a member of the special interest group, um, do do join and then you'll be uh, informed uh, of dates and times, etc. As, as, as they get set. Um, but last thing to say is to thank Michael and Kaki very much for sharing their work, uh, which is really interesting. And we look forward to seeing the, the, the final results from both projects um, in the very near future. Um, okay, uh, let, let's wrap it up there. Um, have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, James. Bye. Bye.